Welcome to Break Forth Fully Alive. We are Elsa and Arlen Salty, your hosts and the directors and founders of Break Forth Ministries. We can all use a little inspiration in our day, and that's why Break Forth Fully Alive is here for you. After four decades of holding events throughout the world, we're pulling together some of the best of the best messages and classes from these events. But before we get into today's show, we want to invite you to head over to our website at breakforthministries.com, where you'll learn more about our tours to the lands of the Bible, our resources, inspiring videos, workshops, our events, and more. Now, let's get started. Lee Strobel is a New York Times bestselling author, evangelist, and teacher. His books have sold millions of copies, and in 2017, Lee's spiritual journey was depicted in the award-winning movie, The Case for Christ. He's taught at several universities, as well as three of America's largest churches. To learn more about Lee, head to leestrobel.com. Join atheist-turned-Christian Lee Strobel as he discusses the evidence that convinced him of the deity of Christ. Learn to effectively defend the divinity of Christ and walk away encouraged by a strong historical foundation and equipped to share the real identity of Jesus with all who would seek him. Here is Lee Strobel. After I became a new Christian, I volunteered at my church to be one of the people who responded to questions that people would submit during the church service. You know, we had a little tear-off card on the bulletin, and people could write a question or whatever and tear it off and put it in the offering plate. And I was one of the team of volunteers who would call them up and try to answer their question. So one day, I get a card from uh, uh, someone, and she says, I'm a 12-year-old girl, and I just want to know more about Jesus. And I thought, well, how cute is that? So I call her up and I said, uh, you know, what's the story? She said, well, would you and your wife be willing to come over to my house? I live with my dad and have dinner with us and, and, and just tell us about Jesus. I said, absolutely. And I said to my wife, isn't this cute? This is so great. A little 12-year-old girl wants to know what this is. This is wonderful. So we get in the car on a Friday night. We drive over to their apartment. We walk. He, he, the father answers the door. And as I'm walking into their apartment, I look, and there's a coffee table. And on the coffee table is stacked these huge, heavyweight volumes of books attacking Christianity. Turned out this guy was a scientist. And he had spent the last several years of his life, as I had, investigating the evidence for God. He had sort of looked at the other evidence, trying to disprove it, and looking at a lot of writings by atheists and skeptics attacking the Christian faith. So we sat down for pizza, and this guy begins to pepper me with the toughest, the most difficult objections to Christianity I had ever heard. And he was asking me questions I had no idea how to answer. And I, after you know, an hour or so of this, a couple of hours, I began to experience what I call a spiritual vertigo. You know, spiritual vertigo is that sense of dizziness and disorientation and almost nausea that you feel when someone is attacking the essentials of your faith and you just don't know what to say. You just don't know the answer. You don't know how to respond. Now, how many of you have ever experienced spiritual vertigo? Yeah. You know, let me tell you something. If you have never experienced spiritual vertigo, can I tell you what? You will. And you know what? It's probably going to be soon. Why, why do I say that? I think it's going to be soon because we're living at a time when the historic Christianity is absolutely under attack more than any time, I think, in recent history. I mean, we see it in best-selling books being written by militant atheists. We see it in television documentaries. We see it on the Internet especially. We see it in college classrooms where people are um, attacking the the pillars, the foundations of the Christian faith with a lot of energy and with a lot of um, emotion oftentimes and raising issues that I think most people who are Christians say, I have no idea how to respond to this. And we begin asking ourselves questions like, well, maybe I bought into this too easily. You know, maybe I swallowed this Christianity thing hook, line, and sinker without adequately thinking it through. And it creates this sense of um, uh, spiritual vertigo that can be very disorienting. Uh, these challenges, as I say, are coming fast and furious. Did you know that Christianity 
stole its essential beliefs from earlier pagan mythology? Did you know that the church suppressed alternative gospels that tell a far more accurate story and a different story than the historical Jesus? Uh, Did you know that the New Testament is hopelessly riddled with errors and cannot be trusted? These are the kind of things that are being propagated. I I was being interviewed by a journalist recently, and he said, it seems like it's open season on Jesus. And I said, yeah, that's exactly right. In fact, let me read to you an email I got from a young man right after he had read a new, uh, a best-selling book attacking the credibility of the New Testament. This is what he said. Please help me. I was raised in the church, and I'm now 26 years old. This book has devastated my faith. I don't want to be kept in the dark. I want to know what really is going on in the Bible and what I should believe, even if it goes against what I believe since I was a little boy. I mean, here's someone in spiritual vertigo. Uh, he's, he's, in a sense, a panic. And this book has devastated my faith. What do I do? It's like somebody's pulled the rug right out from under the New Testament. I don't know what to, what to believe. In. Well, what are you going to do when your son or daughter goes off to college and reads some of these books and comes to you and says, well, what about these claims that, you know, the New Testament has so many errors in it that you can't, you can't rely on it? Or what about this claim that, that uh, the resurrection is merely an ancient myth that all kinds of mythologies have had and, and Christianity just stole it and applied it to Jesus? How are you going to re- respond to that? What about someone at work who reads one of these books and says, hey, I know you're a Christian. I just read that Richard Dawkins book, The God Delusion. Uh, how can you believe that stuff? It's just make-believe. It's just fairy tales. How are you going to respond? 1 Peter 3.15 tells all Christians, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. And so it's incumbent on us as followers of Jesus Christ to be able to help people who have questions or who themselves are uh, experiencing that kind of spiritual vertigo. Um, it, It seems like the question being raised is, what portrait of Jesus can we really trust these days? You know, for 2,000 years, the portrait of Jesus that the church has presented has been um, the divine Jesus. It's been the God who became man. This is what we celebrate at Christmas, the incarnation. But now critics are popularizing all kinds of alternative portraits of Jesus, different pictures that look far different than the divine Jesus that the church has been talking about for 2,000 years. And all of these people are claiming that their picture of Jesus is the right one. Well, how do we know? How do we know for sure what the real picture is? Now, one of the reasons that we experience spiritual vertigo and and this sense of confusion when people raise these difficult issues is because many of their arguments sound very persuasive when we first hear them. And yet there's a great proverb, Proverb 18, verse 17. It says, the first to speak in court sounds right until the cross-examination begins. Isn't that true? So often when we hear a case presented, we go, that, 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 that makes sense. And then we hear the other side of the story. And when we hear the other side of the story, what we learn is that it radically changes the picture and puts things into perspective. And so for my book, The Case for the Real Jesus, I traveled 24,000 miles, went all around Canada to Halifax, there's a scholar up there, uh, all the way down to Dallas and Charlotte to Los Angeles, uh, interviewing leading scholars and experts and taking about a half a dozen of these major objections to Christianity that are the most popular and the most damaging, I think, and forcing them to give answers to explain why this traditional picture of Jesus ought to be trusted as opposed to these new alternative pictures of Jesus that so many um, skeptics are trying to present. And uh, I, I basically was doing what 1 Thessalonians 5.21 tells us to do, which is test everything, hold on to the good. I was just testing it to see, are there good answers to this kind of thing? And so what I want to do this morning, I want to take three of the most popular alternative portraits of Jesus that we're hearing about on the internet and reading about in popular books. And I want to sort of cross-examine them, look at the other side of the story, do what Proverbs says, and say, you know, when we look at both sides and put it into perspective, we find that these original objections to Christianity tend to just dissipate. 
And so I'll talk about three of them. The first one I want to talk about, and this is so popular, this is all over the internet. If you have kids, I guarantee you they have heard this before and may even be persuaded by it. This is a portrait of Jesus as the mythological Jesus. The mythological Jesus. The essential claim here is that Christianity is merely a copycat religion. That it stole its essential beliefs from earlier mythology or these so-called mystery religions that existed before Christianity. In other words, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, all that stuff I, have, I talked about last night, that never happened. That was not an event of history. This is based on mythology. And the, there was all kinds of earlier mythology about, about gods who would be resurrected from the dead and people who followed Jesus just kind of took those uh, myths about uh, a resurrection and applied them to Jesus. It has nothing to do with reality. It has nothing to do with history. Uh, this is the view that was popularized by the book, The Da Vinci Code. Uh, remember that book? I mean, that was a big deal a while back, wasn't it? Uh, there's a quote in there that says, nothing in Christianity is original. Nothing in Christianity is original. And when it's first presented, I'm telling you, the case sounds very persuasive. Uh, for instance, proponents of this view, this mythological Jesus, will say that long before Jesus ever lived, there was a mystery religion built around the worship of a mythological god by the name of Mithras. And they say Mithras was born of a virgin in a cave on December the 25th, was considered a great traveling teacher, had 12 disciples, sacrificed himself for world peace, was buried in a tomb, and on the third day was resurrected from the dead. Now, does that sound like anybody else we know? <laughs> I mean, you hear that, and you go on the surface, you go, well, wait a minute. If all of that was true of this mythological god Mithras long before Jesus ever lived, is it a mere coincidence that these are the exact same things we believe about Jesus? Isn't it logical to think that, that the followers of Jesus just took this ancient mythology and applied it to him, and we're really just following a legend and following myths? I mean, it sounds persuasive, doesn't it? In fact, in the Da Vinci Code, they talk specifically about Mithras as being the archetype example of how Christianity stole its essential beliefs from these earlier mystery religions. Well, you know what? It sounds persuasive until you do what Proverbs said and you check out the other side. And I'm telling you, this stuff absolutely evaporates when you check it out. I'll just go through the list of the supposed parallels between Mithras and Jesus. Number one, Mithras was born of a virgin in a cave. No, he wasn't. When you do the research and you go back to the original beliefs about Mithras, what you find is the belief about Mithras was he emerged fully grown, naked from a rock, wearing a hat. That's what the ancient belief about Mithras was. There was no cave. There was no virgin, unless you consider the rock a virgin. I suppose then you have a virgin. But that's, there was no virgin birth of Mithras. He emerged fully grown, naked from a rock, and he was wearing a hat. Uh, besides which, nowhere in the Bible does it say that Jesus was born in a cave. Secondly, Mithras was born on December the 25th. Yeah, well, so what? Jesus wasn't. And she, mo most likely, Jesus was born in the springtime sometime. Uh, we don't know the date that Jesus was born. Um, it's not in the Bible. Uh, ancient historians don't tell us the date in which he was born. For, for a long time, uh, scholars believed he was born on January the 6th. Uh, that's still celebrated in some churches. Um, many people believe he was born in springtime, in May. Uh, we don't know the date that Jesus was born. Uh, the reason December the 25th was chosen in the 4th century was because there were already some pagan holidays that were taking place. It was near the winter solstice. And so Christians said, well, maybe we could influence these people for Christianity, if we would kind of, we're going to celebrate the birth of Jesus anyway, and some people think it was in December anyway, we'll choose December the 25th, and maybe we can have a positive influence on all these pagan festivals that are taking place. And so that's how December the 25th came about. We don't know when Jesus was born, so this is not a parallel between Mithras and Jesus. Next, Mithras was a traveling teacher with 12 disciples. No, he wasn't. 
Go back to the original. See, you can't rely on the stuff you read on the Internet. You can't rely on fourth and fifth hand, you know, recapitulations and descriptions of what these believe. You've got to go back to the scholars who have studied the actual evidence for these beliefs. And when you go back, what you find is Mithras uh, did not have 12 disciples. He was not a traveling teacher. He was supposedly a god, not a teacher. And the Iranian Mithras had one follower, and the Roman Mithras had two. Next, Mithras sacrificed himself for world peace. No, he didn't. He'd go back to the original. You know what Mithras was known for? He killed a bull. That's it. He slayed a bull. That was his big deal. It wasn't for world peace. He killed a stupid thing. That's, that's all he did. Um, next, Mithras was buried in a tomb and resurrected on the third day. No, he wasn't. There was no belief about the death of Mithras in ancient mythology. The mystery religion had no belief about the death of, of Mithras. Therefore, there was no death. There was no resurrection. So you see, as, as you go back to the original sources here and investigate this, these supposed parallels between Mithraism and Christianity just evaporate. In fact, here's the clincher. Scholars now have established that the Mithraeus mystery religion did not even exist in the West until after Christianity. And so Christians couldn't have stolen their beliefs from it. In fact, here's the truth. There was a treatise written recently by an eminent uh, Swedish scholar by the name of T.N.D. Medinger. Um, he's a member of the um, uh, National Academy of, of, of Stockholm, brilliant scholar. And he did an academic treatise on this very issue. And his assessment is this. The nearly universal consensus among scholars in the field who know what they're talking about is that there are no examples of any mythological gods dying and rising from the dead before Christianity. They all come after Christianity. And so Christianity could not have stolen the belief uh, about the resurrection from these things, from these other beliefs, because they didn't come about till after Christianity. Now, Medinger says, yeah, okay, that's the nearly universal belief among scholars. I'm going to take a different position, he said. I think there may be a few that predated Christianity. And so in his treatise, he analyzes these examples that in his minority position, he thinks may have come before Christianity. And when he analyzes them, his conclusion is that none of these that he, in his minority position, thinks might have come before Christianity, none of them have anything to do whatsoever with serving as parallels with Jesus. Not any of them. These old myths deal with things like the life and death cycle of vegetation. Vegetation dies in the fall and it comes back to life in the spring. It has no resemblance whatsoever to the story of Jesus Christ, which is reported in ancient literature as an historical event. This is his ultimate conclusion. He says, quote, the death and resurrection of Jesus retains its unique character, unique, one and only character in the history of religions. Uh, for my book, I interviewed um, Dr. Edwin Yamauchi, a brilliant scholar, Ph.D. Brandeis University, professor at a major Midwestern secular university in the United States for, for many, many decades. He just recently retired. And uh, he is an expert on this. In fact, uh, he went to the uh, second uh, congress out of Mithraic scholars that was held in Tehran, uh, Iran, uh, several years ago. And so he is among the elite who really understand Mithraism. And uh, his assessment is this is absolutely, the idea that Christianity stole anything from Mithraism is absolutely ridiculous. All of this came after Christianity. Some of the beliefs that, that uh, were later attached to this myth Mithraic mythology came in the second century after the resurrection of Jesus. So anybody who was doing any stealing, it was the other way around. So you can see when you investigate the other side of the story, how these these allegations and objections that can create this kind of spiritual vertigo just sort of evaporate. Let's talk about the second picture of Jesus that are, that's being propagated these days. This is the Gnostic Jesus, G-N-O-S-T-I-C, Gnostic, the Gnostic Jesus. See, historically, Christians have believed that Jesus is a redeemer, that Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for our wrongdoing, and he offers forgiveness and grace 
as a free gift to all who come to him in repentance and faith. That's the historic belief of the church. He is the redeemer. But the Gnostics paint a far different picture of Jesus. He is not a redeemer to them. He is a revealer, a revealer. The word Gnostic comes from the Greek. It means secret knowledge. And Gnosticism is a very diverse belief system. But if you were to boil it down, the commonality that the various strains of Gnosticism have is the belief that the world is evil, that the world was the product of an evil creator, that salvation consists of being rescued from it, and that the rescue comes through secret knowledge, gnosis. This is a far different teaching than we see in the, the Gospels in the New Testament. Now, the Gnostics paint, base their picture of Jesus on several alternative Gospels that have been unearthed since 1945. The most prominent of these is the Gospel of Thomas. Um, there's a left-wing uh, group of scholars in the United States called the Jesus Seminar. Uh, they published a book in which they elevated uh, the Gospel of Thomas to equal standing with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And this is going on in some liberal churches. I, I was in the east coast of the United States not long ago, and somebody brought me a bulletin from a local church. And I looked at it, and they had responsive readings from the Gospel of Thomas. It's unbelievable to me. Because the Gospel of Thomas uh, paints a far different picture of Jesus. The message of Jesus, the mission of Jesus, is entirely different in the Gospel of Thomas than it is in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. For instance, in the Gospel of John, it says that we experience God only through the divine light embodied in Jesus. He is the one who is divine. He embodies the divine light. He is our access to God. The Gospel of Thomas, on the other hand, says this divine light of Jesus is shared by all of humanity. We all have this divine spark. We're all kind of little gods. Um, whereas salvation in the biblical Gospels is available as a free gift to anyone who comes to Christ in repentance and faith, in Thomas, this secret knowledge is only available to a select few. It's only available to the elite. It's only available to people who are smart enough to really get the secret teachings contained in these alternative Gospels. But is Thomas telling the truth? How do we know it's accurate? Well, one way to determine whether an ancient writing is historically valid is to determine how close it was written to the events that it describes. As a general rule, this is not a universal rule, but as a general rule, the shorter the time gap between when the events occurred and when the document about those events was written, the more likely it is to be accurate. Now, even skeptical scholars admit that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were all written in the first century when Jesus lived. So they're close to his life. In fact, I would argue that because the book of Acts ends with Paul under house arrest, um, doesn't mention what happens to Paul, it doesn't include reportings about the death of Paul, the death of James, um, the death of Peter, it doesn't mention the, uh, the Jewish-Roman war and so forth. I think there's a good case for saying it must have been written before those things happened. So I believe Acts was probably written about 62 A.D. Jesus was put to death in 30 or 33 A.D., so it's about a 30-year gap. But we know that Acts is the second part of a two-part work that Luke wrote. The first part was the Gospel of Luke. And so the Gospel of Luke comes before the book of Acts, so it should probably be dated around 60 A.D. But we know that in writing his gospel, uh, Luke used as one of his sources the gospel of Mark. So Mark must come even before that. Now we're in the 50s A.D. And we know that the writings of Paul came before Mark for the most part. And we know that we have these ancient creeds and hymns of belief of the early church, like the one I mentioned last night, and several others that affirm the deity of Jesus Christ that come back even earlier than that. And so I think we've got a very short time gap between these beliefs about Jesus being the unique Son of God who proved it by raising from the dead, a short time gap between when those beliefs came about and when Jesus actually lived. But be that as it may, let's take the most liberal belief, you know, that maybe Matthew was written in the 70s and Luke was written in the 70s or 80s. Um, and, you know, let's, let's take that. It's still in the first century when Jesus lived. Um, and we have key details, incidental details of the gospel accounts being confirmed by archaeology, and they are rooted 
in eyewitness testimony. Um, Luke said, I carefully investigated everything so I could give you an orderly account about the certainty of what took place. Uh, Peter said, we didn't make up cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses to his majesty. John said, we're only writing about those things we have seen and heard what we hand, what our hands have actually touched. And so these gospels in the New Testament, the Bible, are rooted in eyewitness testimony. And if you don't believe me, it's a wonderful new scholarly book that just came out by Richard Baucom, who's a wonderful New Testament scholar from the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, uh, called Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, uh, that once again reaffirms the eyewitness basis for the New Testament of the Bible. So we have all that going for the Gospels that are in the New Testament. Now, on the other hand, historians have determined these alternative Gospels, like Thomas, were written late in the second century at the earliest. Many of these things were written in the third, fourth, and fifth centuries. So they're simply too far removed from the life of Jesus to tell us anything that's very accurate about his life. I'll give you an example on the Gospel of Thomas, because that's the most common one that you hear about. Um, most of the material in Thomas, when you compare it to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and even Paul, parallels Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Paul. Therefore, Thomas must have been written after the Gospels and after the writings of Paul in the New Testament. In fact, Thomas, as you look very carefully at it, you will see that Thomas is familiar with 14 or 15 of the 27 books of the New Testament. Now, there is no writing uh, in the ancient world prior to 150 A.D. that is as familiar with this much of the New Testament. Plus, experts now believe that Thomas was originally written in Syriac. Well, why is that important? It's very interesting. Uh, the gospel did not arrive in Syria until 175 A.D. And when it arrived in Syria, it did not come in the form of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. When the gospel in 175 A.D. first came to Syria, it came in the form of what's called the Diatessaron. The Diatessaron was written by a guy named Tatian in 175 A.D. And what he did is he took Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and he blended them all together to create one continuous narrative. And when he did that, he created some unique forms and order of the material. He kind of restructured it and so forth and created the diatessaron. And when the gospel came to Syria, it was in the form of the diatessaron. Well, when you analyze the distinctive Syrian forms in the diatessaron, as well as the order of the material in the diatessaron, you see the same thing reflected in the gospel of Thomas. So the Gospel of Thomas must have been written after the Diatessaron because it copies some of its order and some of its forms. In fact, it's very interesting. The Gospel of Thomas is 114 sayings about Jesus, and they appear to be at random. There's no connection. There's no order until you translate it into Syriac. And when you translate it into Syriac, all of a sudden 500 catchwords come about. Catchwords help you to memorize things because uh, in the first verse, there's, there's a word that's then repeated in the second verse, and it helps you to memorize stuff. Well, this tells us that it was probably originally written in Syriac. Well, the gospel didn't even come to Syria until 175 AD in the form of the Diatessaron, whose forms are copied in the gospel of Thomas. All of this to indicate the Gospel of Thomas was written after 175 A.D., probably closer to 200 A.D. You think about that. That's at least 140 years after the life of Jesus. I mean, you, you, know, you think about in the United States, we have Abraham Lincoln, one of our great presidents during the Civil War in the 1860s. I mean, who do you think would be more trustworthy in writing information about Abraham Lincoln in the 1860s? Someone who knew Abraham Lincoln? Someone who was there when he spoke? Someone who was there when he did the things he did as president? Someone who interviewed other people who knew him? Someone who was on the scene? Would you trust them or would you trust someone 140 years later today relying on legend and hearsay and things that have floated down through history? I'd rely on the person who was on the scene. I'd rely on the person who knew him and knew people who knew him and listened to what he said and saw what he did. And in the same way, 
the Gospels in the New Testament, they are the ones that are rooted in eyewitness testimony. Those are the ones that were circulated during the lifetimes of Jesus' contemporaries. Those are the ones that have been tested and found reliable uh, by the incidental details that archaeology has confirmed. Um, they're not based on hearsay and legend, the kind of material that you see reflected in the Gospel of Thomas. In fact, the only places I think you can trust the Gospel of Thomas is where it steals stuff from the biblical Gospels. Besides which, these alternative Gospels, frankly, are wacky. They're just wacky. Have you ever read any of this stuff? Let me give you a couple of quotes from the Gospel of Thomas. This is what Jesus supposedly said, quote, Lucky is the lion that the human will eat, so that the lion becomes human. And foul is the human that the lion will eat, and the lion will still become human. What? Yeah, what? <laughs> Huh? <laughs> or here's one. This is what Jesus says in Thomas, quote, If you fast, you will bring sin upon yourselves. And if you pray, you will be condemned. And if you give to charity, you will harm your spirit. Does this sound like the Jesus we know? I don't think so. Or how about this? The Gospel of Thomas paints Jesus as being anti-women. I mean, the Jesus who was so revolutionary in elevating women in the first century culture. This is what happens in the Gospel of Thomas. At one point, Simon Peter says, Mary Magdalene should leave us, for females don't deserve life. And Jesus supposedly responds by saying, Look, I will guide her to make her a male so that she too may be a living spirit resembling you males. For every female who makes herself male will enter into the kingdom of heaven. And this is not the Jesus who elevated women. I, this is a total alien picture. The bottom line, friends, is this. There are no accounts about Jesus that pass the tests of history the way that the four Gospels in the Bible do. We can trust those Gospels because they were written close to the life of Jesus. They're rooted in eyewitness testimony. They're corroborated by archaeology and secular history, none of which is true for the Gospel of Thomas or these other Gospels, the Gospel of Philip, the Gospel of Mary, uh, and so forth. Um, and in my book, I, I go through these Gospels one by one and talk about why it is that these alternative Gospels are not trustworthy, including this incredible story, and I haven't got time to go into it now, but incredible story about a Gospel of secret Peter that supposedly suggested that Jesus was gay. And that many scholars said, oh, this is a great discovery. We've discovered a new Gospel, and boy, this sheds some new light on Jesus. And I go through the evidence that demonstrates this Gospel is a hoax. It was invented, it was made up by a scholar by the name of Morton Smith at Columbia University for his own purposes. It was absolutely fabricated and has no historic validity. And yet, some of these left-wing scholars just grabbed onto it and said, yeah, okay, there's a whole new view of Jesus. And I go through the evidence in my book to demonstrate this is just made up. It was a hoax. And Morton Smith was the hoaxer. Um, and that's been now clearly demonstrated as they've been, been able to analyze the evidence. So I may mean, just go through one by one. None of these other Gospels at all have the earmarks of accuracy that the Gospels in the Bible do. Now, while we're talking about the New Testament, let's go to the last uh, popular misconception about Jesus, his last popular portrait, the misquoted Jesus. This comes from the title of the book, uh, Misquoting Jesus by Bart Ehrman. Bart Ehrman said, I used to be a born-again Christian, uh, and then I looked at the evidence on the New Testament, the text of the New Testament, and I learned you cannot trust it. And he said, I therefore became an agnostic. Um, now, Ehrman wrote this book. It was the number one best-selling religion book in America last year for periods of the year. I, I assume it's popular up here as well. Uh, and he points out in this book quite accurately, we don't have the original copies of the New Testament. That's true. They crumbled into dust a long time ago. But before they crumbled into dust, people made copies of them. And for the first 1,500 years or so until the invention of movable type, the way in which the New Testament the Bible was preserved was scribes would make hand copies of the New Testament documents. Now, of course, along the way, guess what? They made some mistakes. 
And guess what? Sometimes they even intentionally changed a few things. All of that is true. It's not disputed by scholars. In fact, Ehrman also correctly says, we have between 200,000 and 400,000 variants or differences between these handwritten manuscripts. And so the implication is, how can you trust the New Testament if we don't have the original copies and the manuscripts we do have are pockmarked with errors? This has shaken the faith of a lot of people. That letter I wrote earlier from that 26-year-old young man who said his faith was devastated, it was because he read this book by Bart Ehrman. But friends, we have very good reason to believe in the reliability of the New Testament. And I want to tell you why. I want to look at the other side. We have, friends, far more handwritten manuscripts of the New Testament than for any other ancient writing. For instance, Josephus wrote a book in the first century called The Jewish War. Today we have just nine copies of The Jewish War. And the first copy comes a thousand years after it was first written. Other than the New Testament, the most popular uh, manuscript of any other ancient writing um, is the uh, Iliad and the Odyssey by Homer. And if you put both of those together, you get about 2,000 manuscripts. But for the New Testament, we have up to 30,000 handwritten manuscripts, including 5,700 of the earliest Greek copies. About 10% of these come from the first millennium, starting in the second century. Plus, we have a million quotations of the New Testament in the writings of early church fathers, starting at the, at, right there in the turning of the first century. So you think about this. When you have this wealth of copies of the New Testament, it's fairly straightforward to compare and contrast them and determine what the original said. Now, are there differences between them? Yeah, absolutely. They're called variants. Variants. Here's how it works. Each and every time any manuscript or any quote from a church father has a different word in one place, that's counted as a variant. And yeah, there are a couple hundred thousand of variants between the manuscripts. But that's not a bad thing. Because we have so many manuscripts, that's why we have so many variants. It's a good thing we have so many manuscripts. But here's what you need to know about these variants. Up to 80% of these variants are minor spelling errors that don't even get translated into English. For instance, sometimes John is written with two N's. Well, so what? We know they're talking about John. We know they're not talking about Mary. Um, many other variants are merely quirks of Greek grammar that don't make any difference in English. In English, the order of words is very important. If you say, you know, man bites dog or whatever, it, that's very important, the order of words. It's not true in Greek. Greek is what's called a highly inflected language. Order of the words is not important. There are 16 different ways I can say Jesus loves Lee, and they'd all come out and be translated as Jesus loves Lee. Um, they don't even get translated into English, and yet every time there's a difference in order, it's counted as a variant, even though it makes absolutely no difference in the English translation. Here's the truth. Only 1% of variants affect the meaning of the text to any degree and also have a decent chance of going back to the original manuscript. But even these are insignificant issues. I'll talk to you about one of the big ones. This is one that scholars love to wrestle with. In Romans chapter 5, verse 1, does the text say, we have peace, or does the text really say, let us have peace? There's only one letter difference in the Greek, and scholars are split over what the original might have said. But there's nothing there that affects the teachings of Scripture. There's nothing there that affects any cardinal doctrine of the faith. Now, the academic discipline of figuring out what the original text said is called textual criticism. And so I went down to Dallas, Texas, and I interviewed a scholar who's considered, along with Bart Ehrman, to be among the eminent scholars in this area of textual criticism. His name is Dr. Daniel B. Wallace. And Dr. Wallace is firmly convinced that when you separate out these variants and when you analyze what they are, there is not one single doctrine of the church that is all at stake in any of this stuff. 
In fact, he said to me something very interesting. He goes around the country, and he does these seminars. And on Friday nights, what he does is he assigns some people to be scribes. And he has them make copies of an ancient document. And they make some mistakes. In fact, they may make some intentional changes. And so they create six generations of copies. And those copies have hundreds of variants in them. They're far more corrupt than the New Testament documents. The next morning, the scribes are set aside. They can't say anything. The original is thrown away. And there's gaps in these six generations of copies. And another group of people come in, and they look at these copies, and they began to try to figure out what the original said. It takes about two hours. And then they are able to determine what the original text said by looking at these copies, comparing and contrasting. And, you know, there may be some minor questions in the end. Does it say shall or will? That kind of thing. But he's done this seminar 50 times, and these amateur textual critics have never missed reconstructing the original text by more than three words. In fact, only once were they off by three words. Often the original wording of the original text is exactly recaptured, and the essential message of the original is always intact. And so what's the lesson? The lesson is if amateur sleuths who are untrained in, in textual criticism can reconstruct a text that's terribly corrupt and do it that fast, then isn't it likely that those scholars who are trained in textual criticism can do the same with the New Testament over lifetimes of work? Of course. The key thing to remember is this. In his book, Bart Ehrman did not prove that one single cardinal principle of the church is in any jeopardy whatsoever. In fact, there are no new disclosures in, a book, in his book that cast any doubt on the essential reliability of the New Testament or change the picture of Jesus from the historical one that the church has been talking about for 2,000 years. In fact, here is something really interesting. Bart Ehrman says, I was a Christian, and then I looked at all these problems with the text of the New Testament, and I found I couldn't trust it, and I became an agnostic. But if you look at his book and you open it to the first page, guess who he dedicates the book to? He dedicates the book to Dr. Bruce M. Metzger, the greatest expert on the text of the New Testament in the last 100 years. Dr. Metzger was a professor at Princeton Theological Seminary, recognized as the leading expert on this issue, the text of the New Testament, in the last century. And he was Bart Ehrman's mentor. And Bart Ehrman says, he just extols the virtue of Dr. Metzger. He says, Dr. Metzger taught me this field. In other words, everything I know about this field, I learned from Dr. Metzger. He says he continues to inspire me in my work. He calls him Dr. Father. Well, wouldn't it be interesting to know about the faith of Dr. Bruce Metzger if that's where Bart Ehrman learned his craft and if Dr. Metzger is the, you know, unrivaled expert on this very issue. Wouldn't it be interesting? Well, guess what? Before he died, I went and I interviewed Dr. Metzger. And guess what I found out? I said to Dr. Metzger specifically, I said, Dr. Metzger, you have spent your lifetime analyzing the minutia of the text of the New Testament and how it was transmitted over the centuries by scribes and so forth. And I just want to know, how has this affected your faith? Here's what he said to me, quote, Oh, he said, it has increased the basis of my personal faith to see the firmness with which these materials have come down to us with the multiplicity of copies, some of which are very ancient. And then I pressed him again. I, I pressed him. I said, has your scholarship in any way diluted your faith? And he said, oh, on the contrary, it has built my faith. He said, I have asked questions like this all my life. I've dug into the text. I've studied this thoroughly. And today I know with confidence that my trust in Jesus has been well placed. And then he looked me in the eye and he repeated with emphasis. He said, very well placed placed. This from the greatest expert on the text of the New Testament for the last century. 
And that's the lesson of my book, The Case for the Real Jesus. It's the message of my talk this morning. The deeper we look at the evidence, the more confident we become that this portrait of Jesus Christ as the resurrected Son of God is based on a solid bedrock of historical truth. The mythological Jesus is just a myth. The real Jesus left real footprints in history. His resurrection is not the recycling of some mythology from mystery religions. We have powerful and persuasive evidence that it was an actual event of history. The Gnostic Jesus fails the test of history. And the misquoted Jesus, frankly, is much ado about nothing. So let me finish the story that I started with. Remember the scientist who kind of plunged me into spiritual vertigo that night when I was a new Christian? I remember at the end of the evening, I said to him, I said, sir, you've raised some very troubling issues to me. You've raised some questions that, frankly, I didn't investigate during my two-year journey. But then I said, sir, I seriously doubt if you're the first person in 2,000 years to come along with evidence to destroy Christianity. So let me do this. Let me go and investigate the other side of the story and see if I can find answers to your questions. So I went out, and I interviewed scholars, and I did the research, and guess what? Every single issue that he had raised to me that night had a very good answer. And when I looked at the other side, didn't in any way erode my faith, it built my faith. And I was able to go back to him a couple of months later and figuratively kind of dump this stuff in his lap and said, guess what? Here are the answers to the objections that you raised. There are good answers for this stuff. Um, And I I walked away like Dr. Metzger did with a faith that was stronger than before it was challenged. And that's my encouragement to you. When you feel like you're being plunged into spiritual vertigo, um, you know, don't freak out. Check it out. Investigate it. Go to reliable books and resources. Look at the evidence on both sides of the issue. Keep an open mind. And, uh, you know, that's one reason I mentioned this website we did last night, leastrobel.com, totally free, with scholars talking about why we believe what we believe. If my book, The Case for the Real Jesus, might be helpful, I hope hope it's useful. Uh, Get that to your library if you want. Um, But there are resources out there that look at the other side of these issues. The good news is, friends, we have a defensible faith. The portrait of Jesus as a unique son of God stands up to scrutiny. And I'll end just with a quick story on this. Back when I was an atheist, one of my friends was one of the most famous atheists in America. Uh, He was the national spokesman for American Atheists Incorporated. And um, so I became a Christian, and he was bugged by that. And so... um, But we would get into discussions from time to time, and I would try to witness to him about the evidence for Christ, and he would try to shoot it down. And So one day he said to me, you know, Lee, you Christians are all alike. I said, what do you mean? He said, you Christians, you'll tell the case for Christ, but you won't tell the evidence against Christ and then just let people make up their own minds. I said, oh, yeah? I said, I'll tell you what. You go get the smartest the most articulate atheist on planet Earth, and I will fly him here to Willow Creek Community Church in Chicago, and I will allow him to stand on our platform and proclaim the case for atheism. But then I'm going to get a Christian, and that Christian is going to explain the evidence for Christianity, and then he's going to debate your atheist, and we'll just let people make up their own minds. He said, you wouldn't do that. I said, oh, yeah? We shook hands on it. My very next thought, probably should have asked the elders before I did this. <laughs> Too late. I mean, this ball was rolling. I mean, we, the news media got a hold of this. They went nuts. Chicago Tribune did four advanced articles on this. Why? Because the church said, well, we're not afraid to look at these issues. We're not afraid to tell both sides, quote, unquote, and let people make up their own minds. I started to get phone calls from radio stations around the country. Could we broadcast this thing live? Sure. Pretty soon we had 117 radio stations coast to coast. One radio network sent commentators like it was a prize fight or something. It was a, there's a Christian hit a, a sharp left. I think the atheist on the ropes. Yeah, it was unbelievable. 
The night of the debate came, traffic was gridlocked within two miles of our church. We opened the door, people ran in to get a seat. When's the last time you saw people run into a church? We had 7,776 people live on our campus. We filled our auditorium. We filled overflow rooms, hooked by video. We had live coast-to-coast radio about to go on the air. I was going to be the moderator. I was just about to walk out to begin the events, and the, one of our elders came up to me and said, So, Lee, we are going to win this, aren't we? <laughs> so... So the guy who I chose to represent Christianity, how many of you know the name William Lane Craig? Anybody? Yeah. I think he's the greatest defender of Christianity alive today. A lot of video, free video on my site of him giving evidence for the faith. Two earned PhDs, brilliant guy, and a wonderful Christian gentleman. Uh, So he gets up. He gives the most powerful 25-minute opening statement summarizing the evidence for the existence of God and the deity of Jesus Christ you've ever heard in your life. I wanted to cheer, but I was the moderator. I had to be neutral. So thank you, Dr. Craig. And and now the atheist, Professor Zindler. Yeah, good luck, buddy. So this guy, (laughs) this guy, they chose him. I said, we didn't want to get to choose a stack in the deck. I said, you bring your best guy. So they did. This guy gets up, and he stands behind the podium. And he's about to open his mouth. But we didn't tell him one thing. We hid one fact from him, not that he would have cared. But what he didn't know is right where he was standing, underneath the platform, was a room. And that room was filled for the entire two and a half hours of the debate with Christians who were praying that the case for Christ would go out with all his convicting power, and the case for atheism would be seen as a bankrupt philosophy that it is. And if you've ever seen the video of this debate, you know God answered that prayer. In fact, we had people vote. You know, what's your spiritual position as you walk in tonight? Who won the debate? What's your spiritual condition as you leave? And we took just the ballots of those who came in who were not Christians. They're atheists, they're agnostic, they're skeptics, they're members of another world religion. We just took the non-Christian ballots. And having heard the case for Christ and the case for atheism, over 82% of these skeptics said that the case for Christ was by far the most compelling. And 47 people walked in as confirmed atheists, heard both sides, and walked out as followers of Jesus Christ. And you know what else? Not one person became an atheist. (laughs) Friends, we have an unfair advantage in the marketplace of ideas. We have truth on our side. And when people try to shoot it down, and when atheists write these books and websites and so, I just say, you know what? Do the homework. Check it out. Uh, When the evidence seems so persuasive when it first presented, as Proverbs said, cross-examination begins and we get it the truth. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Break Forth Fully Alive podcast. We pray you were richly blessed. But before we leave you, we want to remind you again to head over to our website at breakforthministries.com where you'll learn more about our tours to the lands of the Bible, our resources, inspiring videos, workshops, our online and in-person events, and more. Until next time, may you become fully alive in the love of God.